Good morning, everyone. My name is Darren Collins, president of College of the Atlantic. I'd like to welcome you back to day three of our five-day Champlain Institute. Today, Jasmine El Gamal and Nick Dowling will be speaking about extremism. And before I introduce them, there are three things I'd like us to consider. First is Newton's law, his third law of motion, that for every force there is an equal and opposite force. It applies to physical bodies. Does it hold for social phenomenon as well? Yesterday, Nick spoke with Nat Fogg about emergency response and covered COVID-19. We've seen one extreme stance on the virus, that it should be minimized, it's nothing to worry about. And as a reaction, you also see the way the New York Times has covered the virus, which I believe is equally as extreme. And I think this ping-ponging of extremism tends to cloud our ability to understand truth. Second, consider the idea of shifting baselines, where what once is considered extreme becomes normalized and resets the very ruler for which we measure. I took a run around Eagle Lake yesterday with Abdi Noor Iftin, and he, during that run, he described climate change as the largest threat in his country of birth, Somalia. And I worry that the horrible extremes of climate in East Africa will become dangerously normalized. And again, this will cloud our understanding of truth. And finally, I'd like to recall year one of the Champlain Institute in 2017. Our choreographer then, Jeffrey Rosen, described the fabric of our democracy as a bulwark to extremism and to rapid change. American democracy favored incrementalism. But yesterday, during Ted Widmer's talk on Lincoln, he spoke of the Declaration of Independence and the then rather extreme idea that all men and humans are created equal. Has our incremental approach thwarted our ability to get to that essential goal? Well, today we'll hear from two experts on extremism. Nick Dowling, we've met before, so I'll keep his um, intro brief, but I wanna be resolute in saying that you'd be hard pressed to find someone with more experience on the front lines of working in extreme environments. Nick's worked in Bosnia, Kosovo, Afghanistan, in the public sphere as the Director of European Affairs for the National Security Council, and for the past 15 years, in the private sector as CEO of IDS International, which trains the US government to handle conflict, cyber warfare, security. He's also a very close friend to me and to the college and has been tremendously helpful in helping us organize the Institute. He's also helped bring Jasmine El Gamal here. Now, Jasmine is one of those people where reading through her biography makes you feel like you've lived your entire life on the couch. <laughs> she is a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council and founder director of Only Through Us, Only Through US, an organization that combats fear-based politics. From 2008 to 2015, El Gamal served as Middle East advisor to the United States Department of Defense where she handled the Iraq, Lebanon, and Syria portfolios. Prior to that, El Gamal worked as an interpreter and cultural advisor for the US military, where she was embedded with the 82nd Airborne Division when they crossed into Iraq from Kuwait in March of 2003. Later, she was in assignment in Kuwait, Qatar, and the United Arab Emirates. She has her bachelor's degree from Clarkson, and her MS from Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. And when I spoke with Nick about Jasmine, he emphasized the importance of her true biculturalism, having been born in the US, but spending most of her younger years in Egypt. That's something no university can really teach. It's my pleasure to welcome Nick and Jasmine to the Champlain Institute. Thanks, Darren. And it's great to have you here, Jasmine, uh, here in beautiful Bar Harbor, Maine at the College of the Atlantic. Um, we've had a conversation about extremism and terrorism for a number of years now. Uh, and talking with Jasmine has always been 
incredibly uh, uh, valuable to me because of the extraordinary experience that she has uh, and the perspective she has as uh, a young woman growing up in Egypt and then coming into the United States. And right as she's starting her career and thinking about where her role in the world is, those two, we have that dark day on September 11th where two planes hit the World Trade Center and it fundamentally changes the re relationship and the perceptions between the United States and the Middle East and the Muslim world and leads to what has really been now a 20 year uh, struggle in different ways, in ideas, in, uh, in war uh, and so forth. So Jasmine, I thought maybe a great way to start out would be how did 9-11 shape your decisions to get involved as a cultural advisor and a translator for the U.S. military and some of the early work you did? And, and tell us a little bit about some of that early experience that uh, started to expose you to these ideas of extremism that would make someone get on a plane and drive it into the World Trade Center. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be sitting across from an actual human being again, uh, even if it is six feet apart. Um, it's, it's really nice to be here. It's my first time in Maine, so um, I'm really excited. Thank you for the opportunity. Um, it, it's, um, when you talk about 9-11, I think it's been so long now that you kind of talk about it as just something that happened. It's become, you know, 9-11, there's pre-9-11, post-9-11. But when you go back to that day and when you, for people like us who are around and we were adults when it happened, it's really impossible to overstate how incredibly earth shattering um, that was of an experience for us um, as Americans, but also for me in particular, and for people like me who are bicultural, who are Muslim American, who had grown up in um, the Middle East and the US, to have this event happen was not only painful to us as Americans or American citizens, but it also really went deep to the core of who we are and what it means to be both Muslim and American, both Middle Eastern and American. Um, it kind of shattered this very calm sureness that we had about who we are, almost like an innocence that was never, you know, we, we have never been able to retrieve again. Um, and so, so when it happened, myself, like many people in my generation, I think that the first thing that we wanted to do was just seek answers and explore what this meant for us. What does it mean? Um, what does it mean and what do we do about it? It just sort of was one of those things that you can't just sit and absorb and then move on with your life. You know, it changed everything for us. Um, before 9-11, I was studying marketing at, at university. Um, and then after 9-11, of course, everything changed and it became this 20 year struggle and challenge to really figure out um, not only who I was and what my role was in the world, but also why something like this happened. And then as an American, and especially as an American who later worked in policy, were we approaching this challenge in the right way or were we making things worse? My career started in Washington working on the Balkans. And what we saw there was the political growth of nationalism, uh, very extremist Serb nationalism and Croatian nationalism that split this country apart, uh, that created this terrible civil war in what had been Yugoslavia and this vile, racist, hateful politics uh, that uh, took the Dayton peace accords to resolve. But even to this day, 25 years after Dayton, uh, the, that country is still very divided as a result of sort of the, the evils, I would say, of, of extremism and that nationalist sort of thought of that us versus them. Um, your first job uh, in this space was with the 82nd Airborne, is that right? And you went in early on into Iraq in the first waves. What did you learn from your service with the 82nd and, and in 
working in towns and villages with civil affairs officers in Iraq about the nature of what was going on there and, and particularly as it relates to this topic of extremism? I think what struck me the most, and I was very young then, so a lot of the things that I'm about to say to you, I, I definitely learned way in hindsight. I mean, it took me years to process what had happened in Iraq and, and to think about what it meant and and the lessons learned and, and things like that. So um, I, I will, I'll say just one thing that I think is important before I answer your question, which is the fact that when we think about the U.S. response to extremism or the U.S. response to terrorism, I think it's important to note that it was a response that was rooted in extreme trauma because of what happened on 9-11, which was unprecedented in our country. Um, but it was also rooted in the sense that the threat was foreign. And the reason I think that's important is because it goes to what you just said, uh, which I think goes is at the heart of this conversation, this us versus them dynamic. The people that flew these planes into the World Trade Center were foreign, but they were also Muslim. So then all of a sudden, Islam became foreign and anything associated with Islam became foreign. It was a foreign threat. They were the other. Um, and so when we went into Iraq, uh, I was working with a civil affairs team and we were meant to kind of start laying the ground for reconstruction of schools and hospitals and villages after the U.S. invasion. Um, but what I found really um, kind of shocking, because to me, the idea of coexistence between my Americanism, so to speak, and my Egyptian side or my Middle Eastern side or my Muslim side, there was never an issue with that, right? It was always, it always kind of peacefully coexisted within me. I didn't think one was any stranger or more foreign than the other. But when I went into Iraq, I suddenly found myself sort of in the middle between two different sides that did very much see each other as the other, as the stranger, as the foreigner, as the threat. And so, um, you know, you, you have to remember that a lot of the soldiers that went into Iraq at the time, they were young, they were, you know, 19, 20, 21 years old. A lot of them hadn't been in the Middle East before. They didn't speak the language. It was a very scary environment for them. And vice versa, on the side of the Iraqis, kind of looking at these U.S. soldiers, very imposing, coming in, banging down on doors. Um, and so it really created this friction and created this sense of you are the other, you are the threat, and we have to deal with you that way. And the reason I describe it that way is that because I think that despite the best efforts on either side, it was just inevitable that the two sides would start to see each other in a, in, a, in a very threatening way and therefore react in a way that we might call extreme today. Yeah, this reminds me of what uh, Darren said in the intro about this. Does Newton's law about a reaction and a counter reaction apply to sort of political and social dynamics? And I think we would say yes. Um, how has the West done in dealing with that initial trauma and sort of counter reaction? That, that we just discussed sort of over the course of these 20 years. What do you see as some of the things that we may have done well and some of the things that we're still struggling with in terms of um, trying to make sure that, you know, continued violence and conflict between the Middle East and the West is not, uh, you know, an ongoing uh, problem? So I remember, um when I was in Iraq, to just to I'll tell a, a, a short story, I remember we were at some point um, in this village in the south and we were kind of going door to door and we were looking, the, the unit that I was working with was looking for someone who was reportedly part of um, Fadayin Saddam, who were basically the fighters that were loyal to Saddam Hussein at the time. And they were knocking on doors, going door to door. And I was there um, to act as the translator. And we knocked on one door, we went in, and the person that we were looking for wasn't there, but the, 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 this family was there. And they were kind of cowering in the corner, you know, extremely afraid and looking at these soldiers, like, what are they going to do to us? And I will never forget that there was this little boy, you know, standing, sitting or standing in the corner, kind of crouching in the corner, actually looking at us with wide eyes and just 
really scared, obviously. Um, and I was trying to talk to him and kind of explain what was going on. Um, but I could see that the soldiers that I was with, um, when they looked at that boy, they kind of saw him as part of this overall threatening environment that they were there to protect their homeland against. All of a sudden, this wasn't a little boy anymore. You know, he was Iraqi. He was, you know, a potential something, always a potential something, right? And I remember just thinking, that's really bad. That is really, really dangerous. Um, how do we, how do we combat that, especially in an environment, in a combat environment, in an environment of trauma, of distrust, of fight or flight syndrome, you know? Um, and so, and and that kind of that undercurrent of distrust and fear has has been ever constant in the U.S. response to um, the extremist threat. And when, so when you ask me what we've done wrong and what we've done right, I mean, when you look back at what the U.S. did in response to 9-11 and then subsequent, subsequently in response to extremism, uh, you know, writ large, we had the invasion of Iraq and then we had Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, which we haven't, you know, discussed yet, but I was there also as well as a translator and saw our response there. Um, and then, um, and then of course we had, um, not only Guantanamo Bay and Iraq, but then generally Department of Homeland Security, we had offices dedicated to kind of combating the Islamic threat. We had the Patriot Act, we had, um, uh, surveillance of mosques and, the reason I mention all of that is not to bash in, in, a, in a general way the U.S. response, because I do think it's important to remember that, again, this was the U.S. was traumatized and it was trying to protect itself from what it perceived to be an existential threat. But the reason I think it's important to lay all of these out is because it laid a foundation for that counter reaction that you and Darren were talking about all of the sudden whether it was subconsciously or consciously in the American psyche, Muslims became threatening, Islam became extremist, and we were no longer able to distinguish or differentiate between American Muslims who were actually American on the same side and the actual terrorist threat. And it created, and we'll talk about this later, but what we see today, which is a huge wave of Islamophobia, of fear of Muslims, um, of stereotyping, leading to things like the Muslim ban and policies that we see today, including the rise of, of right-wing extremism. Yeah. You talked about that you served in Guantanamo, I think, as a translator and advisor. Uh, that's an extraordinary experience because you sat down with, with real terrorists who were doing awful things and to understand what motivated them? What drove them to be part of an organization like Al Qaeda, uh, Iraq, or or, uh, or uh, another um, jihadist violence group? Um, what did you learn from your conversations with these real hard bitten terrorists that you met with? Uh, and also, maybe you met some people who really weren't terrorists but somehow got rounded up. Exactly. That was exactly what I was about to say. I was going to say, I'm going to stop you there because actually they weren't all terrorists. And that was the lesson learned. Right. So I think I was maybe 24 when I decided to go to Guantanamo Bay. It was purely a voluntary thing because I remember sitting in my office in Virginia one day and I was reading the news or maybe watching the news. And Donald Rumsfeld, who was defense secretary at the time, had referred to, and remember, Guantanamo Bay wasn't really in the news back then. This was mid-2004. Um, and we had heard sort of bits and pieces about Guantanamo Bay, but it wasn't really in the news. Um, but Donald Rumsfeld had said that what we had in Guantanamo Bay was the worst of the worst. And that just really did something to me because I think I had been in Iraq and I had realized, wait a minute, actually things look way different on the ground, what we're, what we're being told is not necessarily what's happening. Um, I need to go see what this means. What is it actually, what does it mean the worst of the worst? You know, I wanted to go, and my intention was to go do precisely what you said is understand their motivations. Okay, if these are the people that were trying to hurt us, I wanna go talk to them myself. 
Um, and so I went and my intention was to stay there for six months, kind of in and out, do some interviews, get my information and leave. I ended up staying for a year and a half. I lived in Guantanamo Bay for a year and a half because I understood how there were just layers upon layers upon layers of things that I didn't understand, whether it was about what we were doing as a country and why we were doing it, why these detainees were doing what they were doing, how they got there. And just to be able, I ended up interviewing, I mean, well over a hundred Arab detainees there for their for their um, tribunals and for their administrative review boards. And the stories that I heard, I remember just constantly having this, this real pit in my stomach thinking like, this is not right. This is really not right. And, you know, sure enough, I mean, many of the detainees in Guantanamo Bay ended up being released for either lack of evidence or because we genuinely had rounded them up by mistake. And again, this is not a blanket criticism of U.S. policy, but it just really highlights the importance of and the difficulty of nuance when it comes to our response in these situations, right? Kind of trying, like really understanding the huge burden of responsibility that we have on our shoulders as Americans or as American policymakers when we are going out and addressing a threat like this um, to really be careful, to really and this goes back to the organization that my friend Susanna Cunningham and I started, to really not let our response be fear-based, right? Because when it is fear-based, it creates more problems than it solves. So you have to wonder how many people who are at Guantanamo Bay erroneously or unfairly actually ended up becoming extremists afterwards because of how unfairly they were treated by the Americans and what kind of problems those created later yeah fear is a real um fuel for extremism and those counter reactions we've talked about the other one that we talked about a lot when i was working on the balkans portfolio was the issue of grievance mm -hmm. uh and that is you know nationalist politicians intentionally planted the idea of grievance you know we are suffering because of what they did they have treated us unfairly you know, we're the ones who, who are who have been uh, uh, are the victims here. Um, as we think about sort of extremism, fear and grievance, I think let's pivot a little bit to thinking about challenges in the United States today, because as someone who worked on the Balkans and and looked at the patterns of grievance, the patterns of fear, the patterns of extremist politics in, in the Balkans, one of the sort of chilling things for me to watch in the last decade or so has been to start to see, you know, versions of that in American politics, where we see increasing antagonism, increasing sense of grievance on either side, white vulnerability, sort of, or, or a leftist sense of sort of complete rejection of the democratic process and the government. Um, what do you see as, as an expert on extremism as you look at sort of the, the dynamic of U.S. politics today? And have you seen sort of echoes of some of these interviews you had and experiences you had dealing with extremism in the Middle East and Europe and now thinking about what you see in American politics? I think one of the biggest lessons that I've learned looking at the U.S. is, and it might have been surprising to me, and this might sound a little naive, but um, the U.S. is actually not that different from any other country, from any of these countries that you and I are talking about right now. Um, I think growing up as the daughter of immigrants, I always had this, and, you know, first-generation Americans might relate to this, but we grow up with this idea of the U.S. as just special and infallible and unique and better. Um, why else would our parents have come here? But what you you know what what i've experienced as you know you've experienced it as well obviously and anybody who who's lived in the us for the last 10 20 years um is that it's it's not that different at, at the end of the day human beings actually respond very much in the same way to the same things and so um grievances and fears and identity crises and all of these things that lead to 
someone becoming violent or um, a violent extremist or a radical or a terrorist, whatever label you want to put at it, um, it's really important to understand that these are very human emotions and human reactions. I think it helps when we when we think about it that way because then because then you can look at other countries who've maybe had these experiences before we've had them and look at how those other countries have dealt with them um, or not. I think the you know what I when I talk to friends in the US on either side of any divide, whether it's Republican or Democrat, black or white, Muslim or non-Muslim, you know, you realize nobody is born an extremist. Nobody is born hating somebody else or thinking that somebody else wronged them in a certain way. It's a narrative, it's experience, um, it's all of these things wrapped together. Um, it's what we're told by our leadership, it's what we read in the media, and all of that creates um, an identity and a narrative in ourselves that that shape our actions and that shape our views. So when when I see what what's happening in the U.S. today, I see people who are hurt. And what troubles me is when I when I see somebody trying to say, "Well, I hurt more than they hurt," or "It's my turn now," or you know, actually. If, every, if somebody says to you, I'm hurt, if somebody says to you, I have a grievance, that's valid. It's a valid feeling. And it should, it should not be invalidated by saying you shouldn't feel like that or you, know, you don't have any right to feel like that. I think that's when we start having problems. I'm speaking specifically in the American context. Um, it's important to listen to people's grievances, to actually talk about them, to discuss them. What we can't do, and what I think has been aggravating the problems that we've had as a country, is pointing to someone else and saying, that's who to blame for the way you feel right now. So would it be correct to say it's okay to be a conservative Christian? It's okay to be a socialist and believe in socialist ideas? It's, it's okay to have sort of views about where you think the world are that may be quite different from most Americans, but where it really starts to become extremism is when you are shut off from a dialogue or listening to what the others, and you oppose that idea of fear and that idea of grievance to everyone else who doesn't believe the way you do. Is that Am I sort of hearing it the right way that that might be one way of looking at extremism? We're not saying that people don't have legitimate grievances and they don't have, le you know, it's not legitimate in a democracy, in this incredible experiment of democracy that we have in America to have different views and to have different beliefs. But it's when you start to close off those d beliefs and take on this us versus them sort of mindset um, and a sense that you you're not satisfied to be a participant in the in the democracy but in fact you need to um you need to do more than that either through violence or through what i would call precursor to violence types of things which is starting to control messages or what truth is mm -hmm. or what political norms you're now going to discard so that you can get your way regardless of whether it's true to the democracy or not um, would, am I on the right track in terms of what we should be concerned about in terms of extremism in America? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, I mean, everybody's entitled to believe what they want to believe. Everybody's entitled to do what they want to do as long as it kind of stays within themselves, as long as they're not forcing it on someone else. I mean, um, I'm a runner, you know, I've run marathons before, but I think ultra marathoners are extreme. <laughs> but they can do whatever they want as long as they don't force me to run ultra marathons as well. Um, you can believe whatever you want to believe, but at the end of the day, the U S has a, it, there's a system. And I think kind of trying to disrupt that system in a violent way, going, uh, going outside of that system and thinking that you're right, everyone else is wrong. And now you have to, you know, using violence if necessary, kind of change the way other people think that's when we start to get into dangerous territory. And I agree with you completely that the precursor 
what you just said is extremely important because there is an environment in which someone feels comfortable and free enough to use violence against somebody else. When, when, that in, when there's an environment that is enabling, that, is, that, uh, that says to the other person or makes them feel like you can go ahead and do something to hurt somebody else, that is just as dangerous as the act itself, right? So just as an example, so we're, we're not being vague, I mean, in, in, when, when President Trump was um, running for president during the ca uh, campaign, the last campaign, um, he very famously said during a rally, I think, a campaign rally, he said, Islam hates us. So if I said to you, something hates you, what, what's your reaction? I mean, how do you feel? What's your reaction to that? Defensive and, and wanting, distrustful of them and so forth. Defensive, and that distrustful, counter -reaction, exactly. Right? Defensive, distrustful, fearful ready to protect yourself and your family against this thing that hates you. So was that speech violent? Did the president or the candidate at the time, did he commit an act of violence? No. But did he create an opportunity or an environment where someone could commit an act of violence? Yeah. And it goes to this, again, this sense of reaction, counter reaction, I think, which is, you know, I've seen it in American politics where you have, we've seen this erosion of norms, right? Where um, traditions and rules of the Senate and the Congress about respecting the rights of individual senators to object to appointees or to follow a certain process to make sure that the views of the minority are, are respected. You know, increasingly we've seen in, in presidents and, uh, and leaders in Congress start to weaken and dilute those and you're going to have a counter reaction to that right if the republicans act in a uh belligerent way in terms of using you know exploiting executive orders and ignoring sort of rules of uh, of the parliamentary uh, system that uh, that has been a tradition in the u.s senate for for decades the democrats are then going to come in and do the same in fact we know mitch mcconnell used what harry reid did as an excuse for him to to do some of those actions as it relates to judicial appointments. So again, it goes to this sort of, once you turn this uh, into sort of an antagonism and a competition where you start to weaken norms and you start to weaken the ability to see a common set of facts, I feel like those are sort of the precursors to really sort of set us apart from each other. But I do think it's it's sort of tricky in the sense of, there are some really vile ideas out there and some ideas that much of the country finds really offensive mm -hmm. to much of, of the country and certainly the left part of the country. It, you know, any idea of expression of white nationalism or white vulnerability or this all lives matter is offensive. And um, the idea that we shouldn't even let people like that speak, we shouldn't let those people... Uh, be part of any organization that we deal with and so forth. There's this real sort of sense of sort of um, attack on that side. And I would say on the on the right and, and to the majority of the country, the idea of socialism and uh, the attack on um, uh, people of privilege or the attack on our uh, corporations or the attack on sort of our fundamental system of being sort of fair, that's offensive to many people on the right and in the, in the, in the center right. So how do we allow in this democracy people to have views that uh, that are very vile, that seem racist or seem, uh, you know, antithesis to liberty um, and, and in a constructive way? How do, how do we deal with that without letting it become antagonistic like that? You know, I have these conversations, or this particular conversation, I have it a lot with my European friends. Um, and the U.S. and Europe are very different in, on, on that particular issue in the sense that in the U.S. we've always valued freedom of speech of, above all. I mean, we, this is a country where you can say anything you want and where you can think anything you want, no matter how vile it is. And for one, I actually, this is something that I 
very much value as well. I think this is this goes to the core of who we are as Americans. Um, so, you know, for example, in France, it's illegal to say something anti-Semitic. Um, do I appreciate when someone says something anti-Semitic? No, I think it's vile. But do I think that people have a, the right to say, to, to speak their minds? It is who we are as Americans. I think it is very dangerous to try to censor people's thoughts or ideas. Um, that's not who we are, I think. But I think the problem comes when you start to think of these ideas as a zero-sum game. It kind of goes to what you just said. About, there's no room for different ideas. It's my way or the highway. That's when the problems start. That's when extremism takes root. It's when, it's when everything, if, you, if, if, if that person wins, that means you've lost. And I, I think that's where we are right now, unfortunately. That's what I see in the U.S., whether it's, I mean, and it's not a generational thing. It's not a color thing. It's not, it's not anything. It's, it's the same on the far left as it is on the far right. It's this idea that you should not be allowed to say or think or do whatever it is you're doing because it's wrong. How does the changes in the media over the last decade or two affect this thinking about us versus them and the others? What, what do you see in that? Let me just say one thing quickly before I answer that. The reason I think this zero-sum game kind of trying to silence the other is so dangerous is because I think that, and we've seen this, again, in other countries and other situations, when a person feels that they cannot express the grievances that they have verbally or you know, in a way that is nonviolent, they might resort to violence to express their feelings. So I always think it's better to let someone say what they want to say, let it pass, let them have their, um, there was some, I remember my dad used to tell me um, that in Egypt, you know, Egyptians are famous for their jokes. They just joke all day, no matter how miserable their situation is, they, they have a joke, they make a joke out of it. I remember him telling me that um, rulers throughout, you know, Egyptian history, they always allowed, they, they would always allow, it, it doesn't happen so much anymore, um, people to make jokes about them. And it was because, you know, if they're joking about us, if they're kind of letting out their grievances through jokes, then they're not going to do something that gives us more of a headache. So it's kind of that same, um, that same concept. So that brings us to um, the media and the role of the media. The thing is, Nick, I mean, when you look at the media today, we were talking about this last night, right? Our media is so polarized. It's a reflection. It's both a reflection of our society and it's kind of the cause of some of the, the polarization that's happening in our society in the sense that, it, it, okay, if you're Republican or Democrat, let's say, you can be watching two different channels reporting on the same incident or the same event, but the way those that event is being interpreted by these two different sides, let's say Fox News and CNN or whatever, by the time that information gets to you, it is a completely different event. So not only are you not able to discuss the event because you're watching different news channels, or you're not, you're not watching, you know, the, the liberal is not watching Fox and the conservative is not watching CNN, but the event itself is in question. The interpretation of the event is different. We've gotten to a point, I don't remember it ever being like this. I mean, I don't know about you, but we've gotten to the point where we're not watching the same news. We're not interpreting the same events in the same way. The same event can have two completely different interpretations. Um, and it's almost like there's this almost physical barrier between um, different sides that is not allowing us the chance to even reach out, um, you, how many friends do you have on Facebook that completely disagree with your point of view? And even if you wanted to find someone on Facebook to engage with, how would you find them? Like Facebook's algorithm just shows you the same thing that you already believe. How are we supposed to reach out to people um, who think differently than we are? So you have a situation where Americans are now completely, not just polarized, but siloed in their own worlds and 
one world doesn't have to have any contact with the other if unless you make a proactive effort to do so. Yeah. And we know that, you know, control of the media and the message and the facts is what tyrants from the beginning of history have used. And that is they tell their version of the facts to control the population and to control their political uh, constituency and use of things like grievance and us versus them thinking and sort of classic tactics for uh, a dictator or a tyrant or a political nationalist who's trying to control our population. So as we as we see media dividing us into camps and we just keep feeding ourselves the same, uh, you know, ideology that we already believe in, uh, it's natural that so much of the media on Fox is this aggressive anti-liberal, um, you know, spew about AOC or about Hillary Clinton or about uh, Black Lives Matter. Same thing if you go to the liberal outlets, the, the amount of hate and, and, and antipathy and antagonism towards conservatives, towards Trump, towards Republicans generally, it, it, it's way ratcheting up more compared to where, where it was when we had fewer media channels, but those media channels managed to focus on speaking to the whole country rather than just our constituency. Right. So I, and- I think uh, you know, that's a key pillar of our democracy that we really need to think about how we can do better. And one of the things all of us can do, I think, is actively go and seek to support media that really is objective right. and, and to seek alternative media sources as you gather your facts about what's going on in your life rather than rely on one channel. Of course. I mean, look, I mean, we're not going to change the media landscape today. I mean, the media landscape, it is what it is. A lot of people get their news from social media now, and there's no there's no way to, to stop that. But um, we're missing a couple of things. So, for example, when the president goes on Fox News and speaks directly to the Fox News viewer and frankly lies most of the time to the Fox News viewer, why would that Fox News viewer proactively go and get information from someone else to cross-check their own president who's speaking directly to them on their own preferred channel, right? Um, So it it, it just makes it very difficult. No one, we're human beings. We don't like to necessarily, I mean, you and I are different maybe. We don't like most human beings don't prefer to go outside their comfort zone. Right. If you're getting your news, your information, this is how you get it. This is the president. He's speaking to you. Why on earth would you doubt that and go look for some, you know, opposing information somewhere else? So that's a problem. But the 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 other thing that you and I talked about yesterday, actually, which I think is important to to raise, is is um, and I fault every, all. I mean, I'm not going to talk about Republicans in Congress because I actually think Democrats and Republicans the majority of them have failed us in 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 this sense but we don't have these voices that are speaking out against this kind of thing right i mean i remember do you remember when john mccain um was at some uh, also a campaign event and someone said something about um obama uh, president obama was president a muslim, obama was think, a muslim right? or an arab or something now President McCain kind of bungled his response because he said, no, he's not. He's a decent family man, which implied that if he was Arab, he wasn't a decent family man. But what he was trying to do actually was was speak out against someone saying, you know, this person is he was he was defending what he believed he was defending his political opponent. I mean, that's the, right. basically what matters. And, you know, you and I were talking about if he was alive today or, if, if, you know, President Obama or frankly, President, you know, George H.W. Bush or Clinton or anybody, I mean, this is not a political statement, if they were around today in a position of leadership and Representative Yoho had said what he said about, um, about AOC, um, they wouldn't have stood for it. They would have said something. They would have said, that is not okay. I know you might be a member of my own party, but that is not okay. So I do also think that it's not just the media that has a huge responsibility. Um, but it's also members of, of Congress, it's people in power, it is media influencers, um, people in leadership positions who are just, there's no, 
there's there's no way that um, that it's okay to sit on the sidelines when these kinds of conversations are happening yeah. and when these things are happening. It is incumbent upon anybody in a leadership position to stand up and say, this is not okay, here's why, regardless of whether it was the member of your own party or not. And I don't think Democrats or Republicans are frankly doing a very good job yeah. of this. Now, as we think about this program of the Champlain Institute at What's at Stake November 3rd, the issue of leadership is front and center. And do we have a leader who wants to unite the country and even if there are differences between parties, respects the idea of listening to the other side versus just belittling the other side. I think that's a key one. But we should go to some questions. Um, so uh, if you guys can put some uh, questions on the screen for us, we'll, uh, we'll take some questions. Uh, looks like the first one for you, uh, Jasmine, is when you were working in places like Iraq, Syria, Guantanamo, how do you come to terms with the feeling in the pit of your stomach that screams, this isn't right? Um, I don't think I've, I, I think I still struggle with that, you know, 20 years later or 16 years later, honestly. Um, I think that it is, first of all, it, it's important to listen to that feeling um, because I think sometimes we have a tendency as human beings to brush things aside that we're uncomfortable with, um, especially when we don't feel like we have the answers. Um, but in my case, I, you know, specifically to this question, I kind of devoted my life and my career to trying to, to make it right in, um, in, you know, very humbly speaking, obviously, but in, in the tiny, any tiny way that I could. So um, I mentioned that I ended up staying in Guantanamo Bay for a year and a half instead of six months. And that is solely, it's not because it was a great place or a very fun place to stay in for a year and a half. But it was because I just felt a huge sense of responsibility. Um, a lot of the, the detainees had grown to trust me as a translator. They believed that I was relaying. I was not an advocate. And I was not in a, in a position to say, oh, I think he's innocent or guilty. That never crossed my mind. But I, all I was trying to do was just very faithfully relay everything that they were saying to the American soldier who who was ju judging mm -hmm. them sort of, you know, on the track and vice versa. That was just my job to make sure that every word that they were saying was being transmitted faithfully. And because a lot of them came to trust that I was doing that, and I was very young, I didn't really have any, I mean, an ideology or anything like that. I didn't have any baggage in terms of where I was coming from. Um, that 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 many of the detainees that I was working with would refuse to speak unless I was the translator. And so I ended up staying for a year and a half. And I finally left because I realized, okay, I think this is what I need to do. So I ended up applying to Georgetown, the School of Foreign Service from Guantanamo Bay. I said, if I get in, I'll leave. If I don't, I'll stay. So I got into Georgetown. Initially, I wanted to be a foreign service officer. So I left Gitmo, I went to Georgetown, and then after Georgetown, I ended up getting this job at the Pentagon and really tried my best for eight years um, as a Middle East advisor to, uh, to inject the point of view of, of you know, middle, the Middle East into policy-making decisions and, um, and vice versa. So that's how I tried to make things right, so to speak, um, and get rid of that feeling in my stomach. But it's still there, you know? Yeah. Let's take another one. Um, what would you advise people to do to ensure that the focus in political and news conversations remains on facts uh, and human rights? Two, two slightly different points. One is facts, human, human rights, but uh, what do you think about I, that? I mean, I think the crux of the question is what, do, what, do we, what can we do? as what can we do as individuals, as people, um, to kind of fight back against this extremism that we're talking about or these waves of, of, of this polarization. And I think that it's really important to remember that, you know, as human beings, as educated human beings, as human beings who frankly are luckier than most in terms of where we were born and what kind of access we have to information, um, 
in, in, in this country where we are right now is to use that privilege and use it responsibly. Um, we do have the ability to go out and fact check for ourselves. We do have the ability to not only get the facts, but use them in conversation. We have the ability to call our representatives, not every country can say that, and demand that they do the same. Every congresswoman and uh, congressperson and senator has a, a phone line in their office that you can call. Um, we live in a democracy. We have luxuries and privileges that not a lot of others have. So I think it's it's actually it's it's a it's a moral obligation for us to use that, and 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 to do it really in every aspect of our lives. Whether you're talking to to your neighbor, whether you're writing um, an op-ed, or whether you're participating in larger discussions. Yeah, I would agree with that. I would just say we need to think more, and this is where this leadership point is key. We need to be able to embrace the idea of what needs to change in our country and what what is a valid, important, robust political debate, whether it be about racism or whether it be about inequality and so forth. But how do we do that in a way that doesn't create this antagonism and this sense of us versus them, whereas the sense of this is a problem we together must solve rather than this is a problem you created and you are the enemy on that. And, and I think as we go through both in the sources of information that we look for and as we look at the leaders that we vote for and in the, in the communications with, with our colleagues, how do we make sure that we have a robust discussion of where our country needs to go without turning it into a confrontation uh, and one where it's, it's exclusion? Um, I, if I can say something, because I know sure. we have more questions and I'd like to get to all of them, but... Um, I think the key word here is discussion. I think the key word here is discussion. We need to allow for these discussions to happen, right? I mean, we hear a lot about cancel culture now and you're not allowed to speak and you're not allowed to come to campus because you're, what you're saying is hurtful. I don't agree with that because if you don't have that discussion, how are you even going to begin to, to um, heal the rifts that are happening in our in our country and our society. So as a quick example, I remember one time I was maybe on CNN or some news uh, show and I said something um, that one of the viewers perceived to be derogatory against the US. I think I was criticizing a response of ours on something. So he wrote to me on Facebook, uh, my message, you know, my direct messages are open. And he said something very, very, uh, aggressive you know he said something like if you don't like it why don't you go back where you came from or something like that and instead of ignoring him or blocking him or or replying in a derogatory way i said um i'm sorry you you felt that i said that you know here's what i meant i mean you know what do you what do you think and then this guy wrote me a message this long about how you know it's just that nobody cares about the middle class anymore i've been struggling i lost my job i just and he just went into his grievances his hurt his fear and frankly his frustration with politics and with our politicians that they're not paying attention to him and that he's not heard and when he felt like that he lashed out against someone because that's the only thing he had to do now i'm not saying this is easy all the time and no i'm not saying everybody has the time to do that but when you do, I think good things happen when you open that line of communication and you actually try to have a discussion um, with someone, even if they're attacking you because attacks come from a place of, of fear and hurt and grievances, um, yeah. as we've discussed. Totally agree. Um, I hear this phrase, oh, you can't even talk to those people. Exactly. You know, expressed by people that, that it's just useless and pointless. I do understand that it can be difficult, that political debate, especially in this charged environment today, it can be unpleasant to a lot of people and, and so forth. And, and everyone has to make their own personal choices about that. But as a nation, it is essential that we keep talking to each other, I think. Let's take another question. I think there was an interesting one about violence. Um, how does a democracy survive when we may be looking at large scale violence in our country? Is that something you're worried about that, uh, you know, we could potentially see a further downward spiraling of violence uh, in the U.S.? 
I think it's a really important question. I don't think it's a question that should be minimized because a lot of people get that question and they just sort of say, no way, our democracy is too strong. You know, I'm not worried that our democracy is going to crumble anytime soon. I think there are way too many people in this country who will fight for our democracy. But I don't think we should be complacent about it. Um, I think if we become complacent about it, then we don't hold our politicians accountable. We don't push back against people who are trying to um, to uh, sabotage our democracy, whether it's individuals or foreign countries. We have to be vigilant. We have to be protective of our democracy. Um, and only in doing so will we be able to to really protect it. Um, but it's it's strong. I mean, you just yeah. have to look at the Muslim ban and how it was overturned yeah. in an environment of fear after 20 years of otherizing Muslims. And we still were able to um, to, you know, the courts came through. Decency came through. This is a country that is very protective of its democracy. I don't think um, that we should worry about it, but we should definitely do our best to protect it yeah. every day. One of my favorite Martin Luther King quotes, and, and I could be getting it slightly wrong, but it's, he said, a riot is the language of the unheard. A riot is the language of the unheard. Now, King is known for being a nonviolent protester, and yet here he's talking in language that seems to express some sympathy, at least, for, mm -hmm. for a riot, which is a, an act of violence. And I think my interpretation is King was, King was against violence, but he's saying when it happens, it's important not just to, you know, see those people as a problem or as the enemy or as criminals, but to sort of say, what is sort of inspiring that? And I think this is the, the core, from my perspective, challenge here is how do we allow, you know, a level of, of political um, activism and protests and the types of actions that it was necessary to happen in the civil rights era uh, in order to get the types of change we made. We just lost uh, our our cherished Congressman John Lewis, right. you know, who is known for that incredible walk in Selma across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And he suffered, you know, violence at the hands of the police uh, in that act. And that act of courage really has come to symbolize the type of sacrifice and the type of act that the civil rights leaders of that period did. But we shouldn't forget that we had, um, you know, we had a lot of people, especially a lot of whites in that era saying, oh, you know, this is, this is violence and this is going to stir up civil war and so forth. We, we do have to be guardians of the fact that we're on this downward spiral. And I think that there is a real risk of greater violence and instability in this country. But we have to also recognize that we absolutely need to protect and support the right of our absolutely. protesters uh, to be out there provoking, um, making um, our politicians and our country focus on the question of racism and injustice and these other issues. I, um, I, I think it's I'm so glad that you made that point, because I I definitely don't want to come across as um, appearing to suggest that talking is going to solve everything if only we do it. Um, I love John Lewis's good, you know, his line about good trouble. Um, don't don't stop making good trouble. I mean, um, there are certain things that um, will not. I mean, the protesters and the marchers. I mean, it's the you can say that you can acknowledge that to get to where we are today, we're finally, 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 we're starting to take police brutality against black lives seriously and against systematic and systematic racism seriously. It, it didn't just come from talking. Um, so yes, we absolutely have to protect that right to march to to express ourselves and even in anger, because these are things to be angry about, um, but also to make sure that that doesn't spill over into unbridled um, violence to to no end. Yeah. Um, I saw a question on something about personal habits or something. I don't well, know. Well, I that think was we saying. I think we may be out of time. Um, let me make a short comment and then give you the last word, Jasmine. I you talked earlier about America being this special country. And 
I think it is a special country. And I think the reason that it's been special is that throughout its history, it's dealt with periods of upheaval and political division like this. And for the most part, our structures, our incredible infrastructure that the founding fathers set up and that we've continued to evolve and improve have worked through those issues uh, and made our country better. Uh, but uh, there's a point that a mutual friend of ours, Will Wexler, makes, which I really like. And he said, you know, President Obama spoke about the long arc of history and how expressing a view that the long arc of history is one of progress and one of goodness. And Will made an interesting point, which I really agree with, which is he says, I think President Obama has it wrong, which is that left to left without leadership, left without human courage, left without human ingenuity, the arc of history is towards violence, it's towards hate, it's, it's towards the negative. What makes us better is struggling against our own human nature and struggling against vile thoughts of antagonism and fear and grievance and so forth. It's an interesting sort of contrast to President Obama's idea, but, but that I like this idea that as we think about the problems of extremism and violence um, in, in a, around the world and in our country, it is a struggle to overcome our human tendencies towards fear, towards hatred, towards saying, oh, those other guys are the problem. Last word for Jasmine. <laughs> well, first of all, just thank you so much again um, for this conversation and for having me here, because I, I just think it's such an important conversation and it's been a pleasure to talk to you and, the Champlain Institute and the College of the Atlantic. I'm really grateful. Um, I guess I would just say that I don't, again, I, you know, this idea of whether the U.S. is special or not, or whether it's better or not, um, it's up to each individual to decide how great America is or whether it's the best country in the world or not or, or whatever. But what I think is really special about the U.S., I mean, I grew up outside the country. I've lived and worked in all over the world. And what I love about the United States is not that it's inherently good or that it's inherently special or that it's inherently better, but it's that we, we genuinely, in general, we have this idea of what we could be and we are always trying. We are always trying to be better. And yes, we fail constantly, but we try again and we do bad things and we try again. And there's this constant, you know, struggle to kind of live up to our expectations of ourselves. And that's what I hope will never change um, in, here, here. in this country. And, and I hope we can continue to be an example to people of what you can do when you keep trying to be better. Here, here. Okay. Well, I think that wraps things up for us. Darren, take us home. All right. Nick and Jasmine, that was that was extraordinary. It was a really fantastic hour. Thank you both. And this is just me with a reminder that this evening, um, starting at five o'clock, we'll hear from Kay James, the executive director of the Heritage Foundation. And then at 6.15, we'll hear from Senator George Mitchell and a talk called The Reach of History. So thank you all. Have a great day and we will see you later this afternoon.